welcome to all of you for this very special moment. We recognize the life of Ross Robbins and all that he's done and its effect upon each one of our lives, and we give glory to God for that. Some scriptures to be read in reference to our call together in the Lord. Revelation 4, 13 says, Blessed are they who die in the Lord. Ecclesiastes 3 says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. Isaiah 52, verse 7 says, How beautiful, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of them who bring good news. Now that is fitting with Ross Roberts. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of them who bring good news. The happy news of peace and salvation. The news that our God reigns. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know, we know that when this tent we live in now is taken down, when we die and leave these old bodies, we will have wonderful new bodies in which we will live forevermore, made for us by God himself, not by human hands. A hymn to be sung, I believe, we'll call, welcome to call an opening prayer and Lord's, let's sing, say the Lord's Prayer together. I'll pray and then we'll follow with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come to you today with thankful hearts. Thank you for this life we give honor to today. Thank you for his life and following hard after you, desiring to be all that you would have him to be, giving and serving and blessing so many along this path. We thank you for this moment to celebrate his life and to enjoy, enjoy our fellowship together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord's my shepherd. The, uh, the Lord's prayer. It's on your, on your moment in there. Let's say together, our Father, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Begin the hymn Amazing Grace, number 670.
I'm so thankful to have met Ross. I was a teenager, which was a few years ago, when I met Ross. And he led me to the Lord and changed my life forever. So these are his favorite scriptures. 2 Samuel 22, 20, 33. God is my strength and power. And he maketh my way perfect. Romans 5, 10. And how shall they preach, except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. And finally, Philippians 4, 4 to 6. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. for coming. I'm Sharon, Ross's baby sister, and on behalf of my sister and I, I'd like to say a few words. <coughs> We'd like to remember our brother Ross by sharing a few stories. We've known him all our lives, Elaine for 72 and myself for 70. Elaine can remember going to a one-room schoolhouse in the country, and she was in the first row, grade one, and Ross was in the fourth row, grade four. Ross wouldn't always walk home with Elaine, and one time she's told mom she saw kunk, because she couldn't say skunk. After moving to the city of Toronto, Elaine lived with her Aunt Muriel for a year while Ross and I stayed with our parents. My mom told me that Ross would pull me to kindergarten every day in a wagon with my braces and my crutches so he might get to school. And um, then by then, we moved to Jasper Avenue. And Ross and Elaine went to Mount Dennis Public School, and I and Ross started grade six, and Elaine grade three, and I was taken by bus to a special handicap school for grade one to eight. But I remember when one of us would get locked out of the out of the house, forget our keys or something, we'd send Ross down the coal chute. <laughs> so they go down, go through the house, and let us in the front door. And um, one one time when we were a little older, Mom, our mother got a part-time waitress job and she would assign us jobs to do on um, Saturday morning and we had to do tidy vacuuming and things like that and we would leave for the last minute we would we, she'd be home and within half an hour we would uh, realize that we'd have to just stop watching cartoons and then we all of a sudden rushed around and did the dusting and tidying and everything and vacuuming for a mom got home and we said we worked all day <laughs> so anyways we think that that's where Ross started leaving everything last minute. <laughs> anyways, so anyways, Ross was a paper boy when he was younger and he was given a beagle puppy that was the runt of the pack because the customer couldn't get rid of him. And uh, he hid him in our bedroom and for two nights until our dad found out, he yelled at us and told us we better find another home for it. But we begged and cried so much we kept him for 19 years <laughs> and uh, spirited my sister's backyard. <laughs> And uh, after we moved to Griesa, my brother ran away from home. And we didn't know where he was for a while. Then uh, we found out he tried to join the Navy and he was too young. And so we told him to come back. He, he did go back when he was old enough and he joined, he served for three years. And while um, we missed him terribly, he accepted the Lord and he was in Halifax. And when he returned to Toronto, he insisted that his mom and dad and us two sisters accepted Jesus as our Savior and not just attend church. So he was very, he said, oh, we don't need that. We, we go to church every, every day. He drummed it into us and he made us all accept Jesus at that time. As I'm sure a lot of you know, <laughs> he's done the same with you. And Mark, you know, he told his son, called me, that it took him 12 years to get a set of Bible tapes. So Ross used to sell Bible tapes. And he gave them to him two at a time, two at a time, every Christmas and every birthday. 
But he also gave practical gifts too. He'd give tools and, and battery chargers and things, and we're still using those things today. And one thing, funny thing that Heather commented on, she's Elaine's oldest daughter, was that when Ross would give her a card, or any occasion, he would say, Love Uncle Ross, lady, charity, the spider in the corner, the bird on the wire, and the flyer in the who fly in the kitchen, etc., etc. When Elaine and I went to visit Ross in BC, we had to laugh at Ross because his favorite saying was he wasn't really hungry, but he loved it when we all ordered different meals. So we grab a little bit from each other. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but we could go on forever about our brother Ross. He was so supportive and um, helpful in every way. He prayed for our families and he prayed for. Uh, everyone knew he was very faithful in that, uh, but uh, we just wanted to tell you that he was a wonderful brother. He, gave, he gave, took care of us, and uh, we will miss you, Ross, and never forget the love that you loved your family, your Lord, and all your friends. Thank you. as an electrician on a battleship. This is where he met William Mason, who introduced my dad to his younger sister, Leela. They married in 1967, and two years after that, I came into the picture, followed shortly after by my fine brother, Aaron. My earliest memories of my father take me back to the early 70s, where we lived in a small home on a large lot beside the Rouge Valley. We had three horses that our mom would ride and care for while dad was busy working as a manager at a moving company were shooting at targets with our Daisy DB guns. There was always a new adventure waiting around the corner for us with that. We often never knew where we were going or who we would meet next. Interesting people, many down and out, would be taken under Dad's wing to be given a place to stay or a meal or two. I remember there was the 85-year-old man who traveled across the country preaching the word of God while also playing the bugle while standing on his head. And then there was the street person, Arel who lived with us for a while and made a stew from the family cat, or at least we think, as we never could find Jeremiah after a real stay with us. Growing up with Dad men, we were often at a conference or a stranger's home in some unknown town or city. This was quite boring for a young child at times, but we always knew it was for the greater good. Dad would often, Dad would offset this for us with vacations and getaways. He took the time to build us a cool fort to play in and a skating rink in the backyard. We traveled on several canoe trips with friends that left us with everlasting memories we always enjoyed looking back on, reminiscing about. I remember many trips when we would take to Florida and later to the East Coast, first in a camper van and later in a motorhome. Although the four trips were often Disney World destinations, there were always other stops along the way where Dad would network with his many contacts. Dad being a multi-level marketing guru, was always involved in the latest and greatest business opportunity. One of his businesses that proved very successful and blessed many people's lives was the Christian Bible Tapes, which he sold for many years and formed Act 20, Acts 29 International from. We loved listening to the Bible character building stories he sold, playing them over and over again as we traveled from one place or another or just before falling asleep at night. Dad always took it upon himself to witness the message of God's everlasting love and saving grace to everyone he met passing blessings along to others as he, as he was so blessed by God himself. This was our dad's unique undertaking in life, to be a blessing to others. There were so many relationships he made throughout all of North America and even into Haiti. Our dad had many trips there on missions to help the poor people and broadcast scriptures throughout the airwaves and over the island. In January of 1998, dad was on a business out of town. He would take time to write down messages and inspiration to both Aaron and I. The last message he wrote stood out for me. Dear Paul, life lesson number four, cut your own wood. To get the most out of studying God's word requires diligence and perseverance, not just going to church to sit under a sermon, but rather studying it yourself. The results are really worth the effort. The founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, A.B. Simpson, once said, God has hidden every precious thing in such a way 
that is a re it is a reward to the diligent, a prize to the earnest, but a disappointment to the slothful person. Even nature herself hides treasures. She hides nuts in the shell as a thorny case, a pearl she buries in a shell waving out beneath a blanket of water, gold she imprisons in a rock and is only found after you crush the rock that encloses it. Even the soil only gives its harvest to a laboring farmer. So truth and the deeper understanding of God must be earnestly sought. Henry Ford is created, credited with saying, cut your own wood and warm yourself twice. If you really want to enjoy and get the most out of your Bible, you should cut your own wood by studying things for yourself. Check the cross-references and other study helps in the Bible and ask God how each passage can apply to your life. The truth you discover for yourself in His world, in His Word, will be exciting and have fresh new flavor to quench your needs every day. Make it a habit of chopping a little bit of wood every day and you will become strong in what you believe and, in your, and your Heavenly Father will be pleased and bless you accordingly. As always, your caring dad. His little scripts, inscriptions, and Bible verses written in the books and cards he gave me will always be cherished. In 1995, Dad remarried, starting over with his new life partner, Mary. They lived together in Mississauga until Dad felt God calling him to pack up and move to BC. I also know the warmer climate has some encouraging factor into his decision. As many of you know, Dad had a gift for collecting books. Not only for himself, but he would collect books for others, as I'm sure many of you know. Dad had, um, many, many of you have been given a book or two by him from time to time. With Dad's immense collection of books and collectibles, um, it was a huge undertaking to move him to the other side of the country. In 2001, Dad and Mary were finally successful in relocating to Port Coquitlam and eventually the mission where they settled beside the Stave River feeding into the mighty Fraser. It is a beautiful place where I was fortunate enough to visit several times with my family. Although my dad's heart was filled with love for others, his physically his heart was weak. Whether it was genetics, diet, type 1 diabetes, or a combination of these factors, he underwent quadruple bypass surgery, followed by many more operations to keep him alive. My father was able to live as long as he did because of his will to do God's work. Amazing health care, and because he had Mary to unconditionally provide him with all he needed to live out his last days comfortably. For his and Mary's retirement, it was around 2009 that Dad bought a 1976 all propane powered motorhome. They extended the invitation to us to come to use the motorhome whenever we wanted. Seeing this as a great opportunity for a family vacation, Carrie and I, with our boys Colin and James, traveled out and toured the Sea to Sky Highway up to Whistler and out to Tofino in that old but really cool retro mobile named the Empress. We had so much fun. We returned in 2012 and took the Empress down the Pacific Coast 101 Highway nearly to California before running out of time and turning back north again. The boys had a great time seeing their grandfather and being spoiled by Mary's hospitality. In 2014, James and I returned for a shorter but just as fun adventure in the Empress while having a great visit with Dad and Mary. This was the last time I would see my father on this earth. Our dad's work was never finished, as is with God, who has no beginning and no end. There was so much needing to be done in our dad's life, and he never seemed to find enough time to do it. As is with many of our lives, dad taught us to make the best with what you have, and knowing God will make it even better. Don't you love to hear words like that from a son who pays honor to his father? Yes. husband, a good brother, 
father and grandfather, but he also he was also a spiritual father to many. Even in the last few years, while he was in so much pain, he would ask God to set up appointments so that he could share the gospel with someone. Second Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. In conclusion, Mary says, I love you, Ross, and I will see you in heaven. Shalom and love to all of you. Mary. I had a nice chat with her for over an hour last night. It's a beautiful time with her. Um, anyway, from me, thank you for sharing this time celebrating the life of my father and for the support given to his family and friends. For those of you who don't know me, which I'm too many, but uh, I'm Aaron, Ross's youngest son. Um, it was not easy growing up with separated parents. There were a lot of hurt and confused emotions, strange scheduling, odd time commitments, and at times, divisions of loyalty to circumvent and navigate, and that was just me. If it was that difficult and emotional for me, then I couldn't even imagine what my parents had to endure. In the beginning, there can be a lot of blame and anger when part of a divorced family. But as I got older and ref with reflection, I realized that both my parents did an exceptional job to the best of their abilities and never failed to love my brother and I. My parents did the best they could with the situation they were in. Unlike other kids growing up in divorced families that I knew who had absent fathers, my father stayed active in our lives. He loved having my brother and I around him spending time together, whether it was doing something exciting and grand, like trips in a motorhome to Disney, the East Coast, down through the Eastern States, or just church, movie, or dinner. Every moment I felt proud that I still had a father in my life. In my early teens, I had some difficult and rebellious times kind of crazy here. But my father saw through that facade and accepted me for who I was on the inside. My true self, my true character. That support from both my parents was an invaluable cornerstone for my personal development into a young adult. Reflecting back on my time spent with my dad, there are just too many standing moments, and I can only really touch on just a few. When I was quite young, I started playing baseball. I played for six years, making it to the rep level. I decided I wanted to try pitching, and my dad was there for me 100%. He would show me, show up after my school, and practice with me for what seemed hours, arrive early to my games, and make sure I was well warmed up. And it was that time together that I felt the support that I really needed. Midway through our playing season, our coach quit, and my dad stepped up and volunteered to coach. He made a long trip from Pickering to Markham every week. That year, our team won the championship with me pitching a no-hitter, with my dad stepping up to the plate, pun intended. Uh, in that championship, my self-confidence and new abilities grew. After baseball, my dad introduced me to the game of tennis, playing, teaching, and encouraging every week to the point where I was playing Ontario tournaments. I'm thankful for his patience and belief in me and although I never made it to Wimbledon, I did develop into a certified coach and hopefully inspired a new generation of Wimbledon hopefuls. Our canoe trips were wonderful times together. We would rely on each other through long days of paddling and startling animal encounters. There were no distractions of TV, radio, or computers and game consoles. I would add cell phones to that list, but we didn't have those back then. Only the guys in Star Trek had those fancy futuristic handheld communicators. Every weekend that my dad had Paul and I, we made our way to church. I can't remember a time where we were ever on time. Most times, I was a little late today, sorry. In honor. <laughs> Most times, we would have to wait in the lobby until a hymn would start, then try to sneak in and find a spot just a little ways from the back. I really felt sorry for the wonderful people we sat beside, God bless them, in their ears. You see, my voice is very much like my father's. In fact, people have gotten us mixed up on the phone before. Now, God gives people talents, and good singing voice was not one of them for us. My dad and I would start singing as we were supposed to, and people within at least a two pew radius would nonchalantly peer over the, in our direction wondering where the hideous noise was coming from. In fact, my dad tried me out with singing lessons. After one lesson where I really tried, 
The singing instructor kindly asked if I were interested in trying out any instruments. <laughs> Not too long afterwards, my dad bought me a drum set. Later in life, I got busy with school, work, and relationships. I didn't see my dad as much, and both my brother and I were concerned about my dad's lack of companionship later in life. Not too much time had passed, and we were introduced to Mary. What a godsend she was, a wonderful, warm, and loving person. We were and still are truly blessed to have Mary in our lives. Please continue to have Mary in your prayers at this time as she is dealing with a mountain of dad's responsibilities and stuff in us. Being a husband of 20 years, Thanks, John Hershey, for marrying us. You do good work, man. <laughs> 20 years married and my own venture into fatherhood with two beautiful daughters. My dad continued to always be there for me when I needed him. We would talk about faith, the Bible, God, expectations and relationships. Our visits turned to phone conversations when we moved across the country from one another. Our talks would go into the early morning, and he would always want to pray for me and my family, for our health, faith, and prosperity. Right to the end of his life here on earth, he never gave up being that mentoring father, that stoic figure of faith in God and eternal life. In closing, I have two personal spiritual experiences to share with you. I had been given a vision, and recently, June 4th, a visitation from my father. I would like to tell you that my dad is alive and well, more alive than he has ever been. Early fall of last year, I was given a vision. I was with someone. I did not see them, but knew their presence was with me. A guide, an angel, not sure. There was a crowd of people dressed in white robes with a Romanesque stone bridge over a small path. There was excitement in the air, and everyone started looking over the edge of the curving bridge and scrambling around the path to find a good view spot. Although I didn't see him, the people were scrambling to get a spot to see Jesus coming along the pathway and under the bridge. One man stood out to me. He was young, fit, dark, short hair, full of energy and excitement. That young man, who I hardly recognized, was revealed to me as my father more alive and full of energy than I'd ever seen in him. I could not interact with my surroundings. I was only there as an observer. I was truly, it was truly beautiful for me to see, and I'm very thankful for that vision. For many years, my dad had battled with diabetes, heart disease, and many complications surrounding his illnesses. It was refreshing to see him so youthful, bright, vibrant, and alive. The second experience, was a dream visitation. Until today, I have not shared this moment with very many people, including many of my own family. June 4th, which is a Sunday morning, not quite a month after my dad passed, he came to me in a dream. I was in a dream with all the typical crazy nonsense stuff, like a Star Wars Lego parade passing by me, and found myself, but then found myself walking in an empty parking lot. Out of the corner of my eye, my dad was walking up towards me. We got beside each other, and I casually asked him, So, what's it like after you died? What's heaven like? He said he had a very serious question for me. The question related to events in my past that nobody knew. But what was amazing is he asked me this hard personal question without any judgment. Very matter of fact, correct, and to the point. He caught me quite off guard and really made me think. And I thought dreams were supposed to be fun. <laughs> this wasn't a typical dream. He then continued very quickly and in an uplifting tone said, You know God really likes you. He has a nickname for you. He calls you happy. He finds you walking in the clouds singing happy songs. And then I woke. I love you, Dad. Perhaps one day we can walk in the clouds and sing together. Thank you, Carlos. I'm a bit of a talker, so I'll make this quick. Um, my uncle Ross taught me many really important lessons, but there was three that I just wanted to go over very quick. One, the tools. Man, those Christmas birthday gifts, so useful. Didn't appreciate it at the time. Um, yeah, I had little mini tool sets. 
and battery checkers. Yeah. Uh, two, he taught me how to play chess. And I ended up becoming the head of my chess club, sorry, chess club in high school. Chess was so important and still is so important to me, and it's, it's just such a linchpin of life just knowing that game that he taught it to me. And the most important thing that, that ever happened between me and Uncle Ross was he took me out to um, ice cream uh, when I was about 16 or 17. And I come from a, a Jewish Christian household where my father is Jewish and my mother is Christian. And at 17, I was very torn with what I was and what I believed. And uh, Uncle Ross brought me into my faith. And he made me realize that they are one and the same and that Jesus was a Jew, and that I do not have to wrestle with my faith, but uh, it is at home in me. And I, I, I've, he's, he's always been there with my prayers, my thanksgivings, and I know he's here right now. So I just want to thank all of you and him for the lessons he taught me. Well, I knew that Ross was a good man. But I didn't know to the extent that I'm hearing here today. This is just beautiful. That's what this is all about, isn't it? For us to share, remember, have recall of special moments that touched our lives. God touched us through this man, and, and through this father, and through this husband. It's just remarkable. I'm loving every minute of it. I feel like I don't need to say anything. Uh, but the girls, these assistants, call it girls. Uh, the sisters are going to come and lead us in this song, which I don't know, but anxious to learn, which is next for us, and that is called um, a bow. There is a bow in the flower. some time ago, Ross and I, <clears throat> that if I go first, he would preach my funeral. If he goes first, I would preach it. Here I am. <clears throat> Delighted, of course, to be a part of this very special moment and to hear the testimonies of his sons and of family and of friends, not only from here but in the aisle and chatting with you. He was all that I thought he was and saw him to be. 
I want to paint a very realistic picture, a picture of Ross. He was a prankster. <laughs> if ever there was some chance or opportunity, which didn't need much for an opportunity, he would do some kind of a nasty prank. It wasn't just a silly little thing, it was a nasty prank. And I would say to him, Ross, do you get great joy out of doing this? Oh yes, I certainly do. <laughs> so I learned to become a prankster because of Ross. Now I'm not a nice person to be around because <laughs> I learned it all from Ross. But to me that was just the reality of the person, so real, so down to earth, and yet this deep love for God and passing it on to everybody he bumped into. And I mean literally everyone he bumped into. <clears throat> I was reading a book, an old book, a book on the par parables of, of the Bible, all of the parables of the Bible. When Mary called me to say, Ross is gone home. When we finished with a hug and a prayer and tears over the phone. Actually, it's something I learned from Ross some time ago. I looked down at the book on my desk to reread the parable of the grain of wheat. That is what I will use today as my text for Ross's memorial service. Even though he had these little things that he loved to do just to get you and to do the little prank, he had this undercurrent of spirituality, of godlike being that he even felt like, even though I'm being pranked, there's something good about this. And, and I learned some, some of the good things from him. So the overwhelming theme of this parable found in John chapter 12 is the story of my good and faithful friend, Ross Robbins. It, it is the message of faithfulness of a sacrificial life. It's a profound truth found in a grain, a seed of wheat, of greatest value and purpose only when it is dropped into the earth. Its sole purpose is to die. Then and only then is this little corn of wheat, is its purpose known, experienced, and joy, to produce and bring forth more fruit. This little seed had to fall into the ground if it was going to be of any value. And that teaching was what Jesus was teaching to say, and that's what I will do. My body will go into the ground. Me, the Son of God, I will be buried. But in my death, life will come. And how will that life come? It will show up in you, in all of you, and in all of those who you touch. For if it stands alone, it appears useless and powerless, this little seed. But if it is dropped into the ground and left to die, the result is phenomenal. Thus the story emerges from this parable, a corn of wheat, a life burying its identity in the exemplary life of Christ. Choosing to do life God's way produces immeasurable results in life all around us. I recall hearing, and I love it, seemingly endlessly from preacher, preachers throughout my lifetime, plant your life seed in Him, in Christ, and watch that seed life grow in the lives of hundreds you encounter in your lifetime. You've heard it, have you not? The life of self is death. The death of self is life. If a seed, a kernel of wheat, a corn, is left in a bin, it stands alone. Ross learned that early in his life. After much pain and heartache, this was where I found him and met him, life had served him up a dreadful bowl of pain. I watched him as he laid his life down, literally laid his life down, a seed buried in his God, and witnessed the miracle of a life-giving man's servant transmit that life into the lives of those he daily encountered. I traveled with him on several business trips 
We were the two that sold these Bible tapes to everybody we could possibly sell them to. And my kids still have them, and their kids have them, and they're still listening to them and learning about God and learning all the good things you can as to how to live life Jesus' way. <clears throat> so let me find my place now. I'm going to wait for myself. <clears throat> so I traveled with him on these several business trips and watched him daily jam this New Testament into his back pocket. Every day that we would start out, he'd get himself dressed. The last thing he'd do is grab this New Testament and jam it into his back pocket. It didn't fit, but he made it. <laughs> and he took that with him everywhere he went. And he used it as a means of witness. And seldom did he ever, in fact, I don't remember a time when we were ever together with anybody, people we knew or didn't know, mostly people we didn't know. Out would come that New Testament. He opened that up to the pick chosen scriptures he had, and before we knew it, this person was weeping, crying, asking the, the Savior, the Christ, into their lives before we left them. It was just routine. It was the way it was. It became a, a passion of mine. When I grow up, I want to be like Ross. <laughs> Wanting to tell somebody about Jesus passing the truth of the law. At that time, I was a minister. I was already learning more than I'd ever learned in any school I prepared for. So as we walked out the door, out would come that New Testament off his table, slam it into his back pocket, and on we would go. More times than not, when the day's job was done, he'd talk to at least three to five or six people he had found in the course of this information, but I learned that there are, on an average, three ears of corn on one stalk. Each ear of corn has, on the average, 70 kernels of corn. That's 210 kernels of corn coming from one little seed of corn. Pretty amazing. And so when you bury your life in Christ, choose to do it his way as opposed to your way, this is what comes from that. Seed, life, more ears of corn, more kernels of corn, more people who show interest in Christ. I'm in a wonderful place. I've been traveling and preaching and singing and doing all those things all of my life and, and it suddenly came to an end in the early 2000s and I just fell into a despair, into uh, oppression. I, I, could, I, I wasn't able to do what I have always been doing. It was kind of stripped from my life. And so now what will I do? And a man came along my path and said, I run the local wedding chapel here in town. Would you like to take that over so I don't have to drive up here from, from far away? And I said, well, sure, I'd, I'd like to try that. Well, I've been there since 98. And I've been talking to couples about Christ. And I'm, every time I do, I see, talk about visions. I see Ross in my mind with his little testament out, all wrinkled and almost torn, showing somebody the way, how to find who Christ is and allowing him into their lives. I owe you a lot, Ross. You are my friend. You are my buddy. You always will be. There's never one who will take your place as my best friend. Out of death comes, oozes life. By itself, a grain of wheat remains a single grain, but if dropped into the earth, nature multiplies. Or if dropped into the source of life, even Jesus the Christ, the spirit multiplies. The result is clear and obvious. Here we are now talking about a love. Ross Robbins, our best friend, our father, our brother, our wife, who lived this kind of life, having fallen as a seed into the literal earth, shall has already been ushered into the ultimate place of life, his final resting place. And I say honestly, I just see him already, standing over there on the other side, looking out, down on us here today and saying, it's worth it. It's so great here. Come along. Join me.
be a part of what's going on over here. Death results in true life. For it released the inner life power which the husk before had held captive, and this life power multiplying itself in successive grains could clothe the whole field with a harvest of fruit. Make no mistake, not only does the scripture itself speak of this truth, so does the life of Ross Robin speak of this truth. If life is loved simply for itself, it is lost. If it is lost in the well-being of others, then by such a loss, life is saved and kept. Ross and I, and those who have chosen to live life as a seed buried in the Christ, have found that a self-life dies hard. Martyrdom is hard for the flesh to face. Self-seeking, self-loving never results in a harvest of divine blessing. However, all self-sacrifice, whether in the daily round of service or others, or as a devotion of all we are and have to God, reaps a bountiful harvest of reward. We know it, for we have seen it. We've seen it in Ross. I've seen it in you, you who I know. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Do you see the passion of the Christ? He had to take his place on the cross. He had to keep marching down that road toward his known death. For if I be lifted up on this cross from the earth, from there I will issue life. I will draw all men unto me. I have through sacrifice made a way for all to come along and join, join me and enjoy the life that comes from the seed of my life planted in the earth just for you. Isaiah 53 says, it was God's good plan to cause his son to die. When I first read that, I said to myself, now what's good about that plan? Arranging for your son to die. And I had a little bit of a thing with God right there. What's good about that? But the longer I read that, the longer I thought about that, the more it made sense to me. This is God's good plan. And the goodness of this plan involves you. And everybody else who hears a word like this, it involves you. Jesus did what he did, went through what he went through, just because he loves you. Talk about love and the depths of love. Nothing, not even death on a cruel cross could stop him from loving you to the place where he can offer you life, life eternal, which he's already enjoying. A little lady came to me not that long ago. Her husband had died. And she said, I want I want you to come to my house. I, I, I need you to chat with me about the plans for the funeral. I picked the lighting. I met her at her home. Sweet, sweet lady. I said, so now let's just talk about the funeral. So we did. We chose the scriptures. We chose the songs, just like the sisters did here for this event. We got everything all set in place. And I said, well, it looks like we've got this well in order. And she said, oh, no, one more thing. And I said, what could we have left out? And I'm going through my notes. And she said, no, look up at me. She said, I just want, want to ask you if it would be all right if, if, if we put a fork in my husband's hand. Uh, I never, is that some kind of a spiritual cult or something? But no, I, I just want him to have a fork in his hand. Uh, okay, I've never heard of such a thing, but if that's what you want, I guess it's okay. I said, what, what's with the fork in his hand? Oh, she said, I thought you knew. And every time we would have a big dinner at home, my mom would finish. When we all finished, she would go around, gather all the dishes together, and as she was moving toward the kitchen, she would look over her shoulder and say, keep your fork. I'm saying to you, keep your fork. 
We ain't over yet. The dessert is about to be served. And you're in for a great surprise. Ross has already set the pace. He's already gone ahead. He knows what it's like. As the says, it's suggesting he's even looking down on us and suggesting that this would be, not just suggesting, but making very clear, this would be the best way for you to go. Keep your phone. The best is yet to come. Gracious God, thank you for this moment. This moment in time when we can honor and express our love and appreciation for a man who chose to put the seed of his life into your hands and die to himself and come alive in you. Who passed on the good word everywhere he went, literally everywhere he went. Not just by speaking the word, but by good and kind, by being good and kind. And such a loving gentleman to all who would give him a moment and all who didn't. We thank you. Thank you for these family members and friends. Thank you for their tender spirits and tender hearts. And thank you that you support them by your spirit, encouraging them along the way until we join together in heaven with one another. Ross, I'm preaching your final sermon and saying goodbye. And I will see you later.
23, which is on the front cover. I'd like you to read that with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For God is with me. Thy rod and thy staff may accompany me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We can dwell in that house of the Lord right here. Enjoy that. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling in number 640.
Mary, Alan, and Flo McGuirl are so glad to be able to share just a few words with you. We've been praying for you over these uh, last weeks. We know that it's been a, uh, a huge change and challenge for you, and we know that God is going to walk with you step by step. We so enjoy uh, our time with you back in January. And um, just as Ross's nephew was mentioning, he um, he convinced me to play a few games of chess with him. And uh, it took me a while to get the cobwebs out of my head because I haven't played for a decade or more. But we had some good times and uh, we just uh, uh, appreciated you and Ross so much and our prayers are with you in the days ahead. Mary, it's just been a fantastic memorial service. I didn't know all the things that they said about Ross, but a great man of God he was. And I know he's rejoicing in heaven, he's looking down, and all the words that he said are going on in glory to the Lord. The life he read, led in the many lives that he took. Our prayers are with you. God bless you, and I hope you will uh, be blessed through this video. This is Teresa, remember? Teresa and Victor, we used to live next door. The neighbor. The neighbors. Yes. To begin with, I am, we are very sorry to hear that he's gone. I think of him every time I'm, I'm working between the houses. Because he used to say to me, Teresa, thank you for making it so beautiful. You know, it was... He was a good man, Mary. We sure missed him. We were when, very for sorry to hear of him. That. When you left, I missed you for a long time. And uh, I am glad that we came here. It was a very, very nice service. Yeah. Very touchy. Thank you. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. We love you. No. Mary, we're just stuck. Uh, we're so sad for you. We're happy for Ross and thank you for Lord, but believing you, I know that's going to be such a goal in my heart. But we'd love to come and see you. And um, we, we have such fond memories of you and your wedding. Uh, yeah, um, we do miss Ross. We haven't seen him in years and years and years. And uh, uh, you get something like this get together today, and it does remind us that we had great connections and great things going on. And we you were would, such a gift to him. Yeah, you were a gift to him, and uh, we'd like to visit maybe sometime. Um, we find out in another month our uh, youngest son is going to be moving to Medicine Hat. So you never know, we might show up on your doorstep one of these days. We'll get, we'll get your emails. Yeah. Okay, Lord bless you, Mary. Okay, bless you. Hi Mary, I love you and I miss you and I, I wish you were here but I know you're here with us in spirit and I can't talk too long because I have to go serve the food so I just want to say hi and we'll see you next month. Love you. Bye bye. Bye Mary. Hi Mary, it's Marlene Reback. David and I got married the same year as you and Ross and I just want to say how blessed I was I am to be here today and to hear all about Ross's life and ministry and the tremendous blessing that you've been to him, a support by his side, the authentic bride of Christ. I bless you. We will be praying for you, sending lots of love your way today. Bless you in Jesus' name I pray that he will work out every detail. Lord, I just pray that Mary would cast her cares upon you because you care for her. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, dear. Hi, Mary. It's Karen Robert, and I just want to uh, say sorry for your loss and that Joel and I will be praying for you and um, we'll be with you, and we know the Lord is with you. And I just wanted to say hi. I'd love to talk to you one day. My phone number is 416 904 1196 if you ever like to talk. Bye, Mary. Hi, Mary. I just wanted to tell you about how much Ross meant to me. And as much as I didn't know him as well as I would have liked you, because we didn't have as much time as I probably would have wanted. But um, before he left for BC, he made a very special note to take me out and to show me scripture and to show me purpose. And he did that by 
at 16, 17, I was saying in the service that I, I was very torn between my Jewish heritage and my Christian heritage, and, and Uncle Ross took me through the Bible, and he showed me everywhere where, where Jesus already was, and he really brought me into myself, and, uh, and then, you know, I mean, he taught me chess, which has been a life skill that has just been so important. <laughs> uh, as much as some would say not, I say it is important, and I teach chess because of him. And there's so much that I teach because of Uncle Ross. Um, and uh, I still have his battery checker and uh, his mini tool set that he gave me because those things are just invaluable. And uh, he was he was the greatest. And I, I miss him and I love him. And I know he's here with all of us right now. Um, so I was just wanting to say something about Grandpa Ross. So the day that I found out that Grandpa Ross died, I was so emotionally confused and sad and everything because I didn't know him that well. And the thing is, I hope he's listening right now that I was, I'm actually writing a story right now and I found out that you published a few books so I was wanting to talk to him. And I just pray that you're doing well and maybe you could just pray for him a little bit more. Hi, Grandma Mary. It's been a really long time, but this is me. I'm 17 now, and I'm really sorry about Grandpa passing. It was really sad because I remember little bits and pieces of times that we had together. And I don't remember much, but I remember that he was a really good person, and I wish that I got to know him better. And um, I just I wanted to say that I remember the little tea parties that we had together, and um, I wish we could do that again. And I'm praying for you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Mary. Sharon again. I'll be seeing you probably in another month or so, coming over to help you. Um, tidy up the place and everything, and um, just uh, Stephen and uh, Stephen, you may have seen him for a while, but anyways, uh, we uh, just wanted to say that we, our prayers are with you, and that uh, we, uh, we just wanted to know that everything went well today, and everybody uh, knows Ross, knows he was a strong Christian, and that we have no doubt where he is. And he went straight to heaven on the express. So, um, anyways, Mary, uh, I'll see you sort shortly, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, Mary. Hi, Mary. Hi, Mary. We are, um, we're sorry you couldn't be here today, but we know you're here in heart. And uh, our blessings go to you now and to all you have to do. And I hope to talk to you soon. Have yourself a wonderful summer. Talk to you later. Bye for now. Mary, you know I'm a man of few words. I know Elaine and Sharon are coming out in July. Unfortunately, I won't be able to come. But I'm thinking of you. And I'm very sorry for the passing of Ross. Hopefully, uh, maybe, we'll be able, you know, maybe I'll be able to get out next year. Anyway, you take care and hope to see you soon. Hello, Mary. It has been a long time. Um, Today is a very uh, sad and very happy day at the same time because we know that Ross is uh, with, in heaven right now and in his glory and we're um, very sad that we can't be there to help you. Um, Aaron? Yeah, anyway, lovely talking to you last night on the phone, it was great. And these are my grown up daughters now, gone up a few feet I'm sure. <laughs> yes, and I am going to be the shortest for sure. <laughs> Anyway, we love you very much, love and you. we do wish that we could be there to help you. And, uh, the girls have already had a chance to speak, um, but we wanted to be here as a family together to say something. So we miss you, we love you, our prayers are with you, and um, we, we just hope that uh, you're blessed with uh, having help through this time, and, uh, and I think that's all. Yeah. We love you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Hello, Mary. Last but not least, it's Daryl. Uh, I remember last March 25th, we were having a big, wonderful visit, picked me up, and in uh, somewhere in BC. But uh, and uh, we went to the dam and uh, had a tour of your beautiful place out there, the trailer, and uh, just uh, I was remembering the pictures and everything. It's wonderful. 
I hope that everything's going well over there. I hope that you're reading well and not get going to too many read stores to get too many books. Because remember, less is more. <laughs> but I hope everything's going well. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's the light always comes up in the morning and sets in the evening. So as long as you wake up, that's the good thing. And with a smile, and shake it up. Bye, Mary. Play a recorder of it.